how's everyone doing today? Good? Awesome. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about creating apps that benefit marginalized communities. But before that, I'm going to talk about some of the roadblocks that can lead to that when you're trying to do this sort of work. So some of you may remember this app. <laughs> I know, it was so revolutionary, right? Um, so in the summer of, summer of 2014, an app named Yo came out. And the purpose of the app was to send the word Yo to someone. That's it. That was the only feature. And for some reason, it went viral. And because of the viral popularity that it gained, they were able to raise $1.5 million that summer. And they're still currently a VC-backed company. So it's still currently an app that exists, and it's VC-backed, right? Blows my mind. So this made me think, what kind of apps are VC investors more willing to fund? According to CB Insights, in, they released data in 2015 that shows that 87% of VC-backed founders are white, 92% are men, and 83% of all founding teams of these companies are white. So, as seen with the Yo app, it seems to me that VC investors are more willing to fund an app that people see as a joke than instead of funding apps that actually benefit marginalized communities. Despite the challenges that come with creating an app and getting the support for it, there are still plenty of marginalized people creating apps to benefit different communities. So I wanted to showcase two here. The first is Tala which was founded by Sharanya Soroya, and it's a mobile app that uses alternative data to deliver instant credit and help customers build their financial identities. This allows people with no former credit or banking history to receive loans that can help them build a business in their local community or help their family through a financial crisis. They have offices in the Philippines and Kenya where they actually hire the people in the communities and not just use them as customers. The second is Appalachian, created by Courtney Ziegler. Millions of people end up incarcerated because they can't afford to make bail. Courtney looked to solve this issue by creating Appalachian, which allows you to sign up with your bank account, and they will round up all your purchases and donate those proceeds to National Bailout, which is an organization that, through the money that they've been able to raise, has sent over 200 people home instead of being incarcerated in the last four months. <laughs> yeah. So in order to give a shout out to those founders, definitely tweet, look them up. They're doing great work. And I want to talk about something that's really passion of mine and something I've been working on for the last three years. So growing up, I was always a very, very avid reader. I love reading books, and when I, by the time I was a teenager, I was going to the library pretty much every day after school. But as all teenagers do, you go through phases of self-doubt and self-esteem issues. So I started reading all these books and thinking, wow, all of the main protagonists in these books are white, and all of them don't at all share any characteristics that are a part of my own identities. And I started thinking, what does this mean? Does this mean that there are authors who just, they don't care about people like me and they don't want to write about us? Or does this mean that there are authors out there but their books are not important enough to have in the library or the bookstores? And it really created a, a, a issue for me. I was really going through a lot of self-esteem problems because I love reading so much. But then I started to question, you know, how could I love reading so much if I'm not able to read books I can even relate to? So this was a time in high school I had no idea about coding or anything. So I had no idea how to create something like that, a resource like that. But I wish that there was a resource that I can find books that I could relate to, where there are authors who are writing about characters like myself. So fast forward to college, when I actually started to learning how to code, I did an internship where I was doing mobile development. And I realized, wow, wait, with the skills that I'm learning, maybe I can actually create an app where you can just easily look, and it's a directory of books that are all written by authors of color where the characters are of color. So I created We Read 2 in August 2014 and launched it. And in launching We Read 2, 
I had no idea any of the impact that it would have. I was hoping that, you know, maybe either a teen like me would download it or a parent or, you know, a caretaker, and they would find books for, you know, one kid. You know, they would find books that were able to show, you know, one kid that, hey, your stories matter, and people like you matter, and there are authors writing about you. But little did I know, it would actually have great impact on communities. Librarians, teachers, and authors of color have found Reread 2 to be amazing for them because they're able to use Reread 2 to find books to show to the youth in their community. So several times I have librarians reaching out to me and teachers, and they show me the new books that they got in the year to add to their classroom libraries through Reread 2. Now where they can show their students, hey, there's a diverse amount of authors who are all writing about stories w with all different characters from different backgrounds, and they all matter. Um, and that's been really important to me. And authors as well have reached out. A lot of authors of color who are self-published and who don't have the funds to you know, have big marketing campaigns and get their work out there, through Reread 2, they're allowed to see readers discovering their work, right? If you self-publish something but don't have the funds to really get your work out there, being in a directory like Reread 2 allows readers to easily find your work. So Reread 2 has been really important to me because it's been able to benefit you know, different marginalized communities and show that our stories really matter. Now in saying this, as much as Reread 2 is important to me, I wanna make it clear that apps are not the main solution. In terms of the issue of diversity in literature, there's much more work that needs to be done to solve the issue at hand. Right? We need more publishers willing to take risks and actually publish the stories that authors of colors are writing. We need you know, more opportunities for young writers of color to hone their skills and be able to actually see writing you know, as a career. There's so much more work that has to be done to solve the systemic issues at hand. But unfortunately, tech oftentimes has a savior complex in thinking that we can build tech that's going to save the world, and that is not true. Technology can help provide awareness and definitely benefit lives, but we need to do more work to support those who are solving the systemic issues at hand beyond tech. Thank you. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about how, once you'd created We Read 2, mm -hmm. Uh, you got it out to all these librarians, and like, what was kind of the, how did you make sure it spread? It's such an awesome thing, and I'd love to hear more about that. Okay, thank you. So the question was, you know, how did I get Reread 2 to spread, and how did I reach, you know, different communities? So when I first launched Reread 2, a lot of the work was done through online communities. So I <clears throat> went online, I created a Twitter for Reread 2, and there are actually a lot of chats, you know, in the library community. The library com librarian community has a huge, you know, following on Twitter, so I reached out to librarians through Twitter um, and Facebook and online communities, and that's the way I was really able to reach the community. Um, beyond, you know, online, I went to conferences that were about, you know, authors of color and writing books, publishing books to reach out. Because being, a, you know, in tech, it's totally separated from the literary world, right? So I had to really kind of dive into this unfamiliar territory, um, and that's one of the ways I was able to really, you know, spread it and get it out to different people. Would you address the benefits of creating an app rather than creating a website that has the same information? Oh, yes. <clears throat> so the question was, um, what are the benefits of creating an app versus a website that has the same information? So, you know, we see a lot now, the data shows that a lot of people don't have computers at home in marginalized and low-income communities. So smartphones, whether they're Android, most likely Android because iPhones are incredibly expensive. I'm saying this as an iPhone developer. <laughs> um, um, so a lot of people have smartphones rather than having a computer at home. And so apps are so much more accessible in that way and that people are using their phones, you know, to access the internet. Um, and so that's why I wanted to create an app versus a website because in my own foundings, there are lots of different, you know, websites here and there that contain this type of information, but it's all spread out, right? So it's really hard to, you know, do the research if you see, you know, 10 books here, you know, 20 books here, and they're all separated on different blogs or websites. That's why I wanted to have one central resource, and I think an app allows you to do that, um, and it's much faster to access. So if you're at the library or the bookstore and you have your phone, then you can just look through it, you know, pick books that way, rather than having to do it online and through a computer. So where does the data come from? Is it submitted by authors, publishers? Are you going out and finding it yourself? 
Yeah, great question. So the question was, where is the data coming from? So when I first collected um, all of the books for to put in the directory, it was all like self-research. So I just researched online, and when I first launched Ruby 2, it was 300 books in the directory. But when I, re when I launched it, I also launched a feature. That's a suggestion feature so that the users can actually suggest books to add to the directory. Because I thought that was also important to kind of crowdsource it a little bit. Um, but I also review those. So I don't just, it's not like you can just submit and it automatically goes into the directory. So through that, we've been able to get now to about 880 right, right now, 880 books. Um, and I'm hoping to get to 1,000 soon. Hi, I was curious, since there are so many writers of color throughout the world, mm -hmm. and, and not just writers of color, but representing all types of marginalized people. Mm -hmm. Do you focus on, are you focused just in the United States, or is there an opportunity to expose people to writers across, you know, around the world? Yeah, so the question was, uh, is there an opportunity to expose um, Riri to in the directory to writers across the world, not just in the United States? So yes. Um, the books in the directory are not just English, so we do have bilingual books and books in other languages. Um, I've been, a lot of folks from Brazil have reached out um, because there's a large, you know, communities of color in Brazil, so they've reached out. I don't speak Portuguese, so it's kind of hard. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's definitely a huge opportunity there, and I've talk to a lot of folks about getting books um, from international authors as well and not just focusing on um, the United States. And But it's hard because this is something that you know I do on my own. I've been able to be blessed to have um, people help out now and then, but I'm the only person who works on it all the time. Um, so it's been, it's been great to be able to reach out to authors who are you know, outside, but because I don't necessarily speak the language, it can be a barrier there as well. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely open to continue to expand it you know, beyond the United States and English books, because I think it's very important too to have books of different um, cultures and stuff outside of the United States. Could you talk about what does it mean to be a venture-backed company versus, as you mentioned, doing this on your own, yeah. putting in your own sweat equity? What would it look like for somebody to actually invest in you uh, versus a Yo app? Yeah. Um, and what does that mean in terms of like the values do you think that we place culturally on this sort of work? Yeah. So the question was, you know, what what does it mean? you know, if this sort of app was VC-backed and what does it mean to be VC-backed versus, you know, doing something on your own. Um, and when I think about it, so I was actually able to crowdfund, right, some through Indiegogo last spring, and I was able to raise um, $15,000 in order to get an Android version developed and in order to get a website and expand um, and get some more work in, in so we're able to do that. And that was really hard for me because I felt, you know, crowdfunding I think can be really nerve wracking because I was like, oh, I don't want to beg people um, to support, you know, this work that I'm doing. But I realized I couldn't, I could only do so much, you know, with working on it on my own and funding it through my, my own money, you know, and doing that on my own was really hard. And sometimes, you know, it's like, you know, you, you care about this thing so much, but there's only so much you can do and so much reach you can have if you're not having outside support. So what I think, you know, for, for folks who are working on apps and, um, you know, software in general that is working to benefit marginalized communities, it, makes a, it would make a huge difference if there are more found, like funders and VC folks who are willing to invest money in, you know, social entrepreneurship because it actually would allow us to ha expand our reach and expand the work we're doing and actually be able to maybe hire some folks to help us do um, the work that we're doing uh, because it's really hard you know, when you're doing something on your own. And, it, and the message it sends when I see apps like Yo found, uh, like funded and you know, people throwing, so, they threw so much money at that app. Um, that really blew my mind because I'm like, I'm here working you know, so hard on this app that I'm hoping is impacting folks' lives in a positive way. Um, and you know, it, to raise $15,000 was a lot, you know, and they got like one, one million in the blink of an eye. So it's really discouraging, I think. It could be really discouraging. And if there are more, you know, funders who are willing to back social entrepreneurship and back, you know, back tech people who are actually willing to benefit, give back to their communities, uh, I think it will make a world of a difference. All right, final question. Where can people give you money? Oh. <laughs> Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, 
wow. <laughs> um, where could they give me money? Uh, through PayPal, um, through PayPal. So my email address is linked to my PayPal. So if people do want to support the work I'm doing with WeRead2, um, you could help out through PayPal for now. Thank you so much. <laughs>